All right, everybody, good evening to everyone. Hope everybody's having a good middle of your week. Please turn your Bibles to Daniel chapter 1 as we begin our study of God's Word, which is part of growing spiritually. The four step growth process is worship God, study His Word, love one another, and reach the lost. We are going to be today starting a new study. Why did it come out wonky? That's not the way it's supposed to look. <laughs> uh, just use your imagination. A little, little Picasso uh, font there for you. But uh, A Remnant Shall Return <laughs> is, our, is our new study. And we'll be in this study for the next two quarters. I'm going to hurry and get off of that screen. Before we begin, I have asked Jack to lead us in a word of prayer. to us because of the examples of the young men <coughs> in the book. And we're thankful, Heavenly Father, for Adam and for Brian who uh, teach this class. And we pray that we will all learn much from it. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So we're going to spend most of our time tonight uh, just introducing the next two quarters. Um, and actually, I should say, we're going to spend part of our time doing that, and then probably most of our time actually in Daniel chapter 1. So let's just kind of jump off here and do our 17 Bible periods. All right? Do you... Yeah, anybody need books? <clears throat> Raise your hand. Okay, so you tell me. We'll just go through these real quick. What's the first Bible period? All right, the creation stories, but what do we actually call that in our list of 17 periods? We call it before the flood, and that should jar your memory to what the next one is, which is <laughs> the flood. And then after the flood, scattering of the people, right? Scattering of the people, all right? Then what? All right, so that's right. So we have the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right, what about next? Exodus. Sir? Exodus. Yeah, Exodus, that's right. Next, wandering. wandering in the wilderness. Can we go a little quicker? Sorry to, I'm, I got a lot to cover. What's after wandering in the wilderness? Conquest. Invasion and conquest. Kings. Not yet. Kingdom. Judges. And then what? United, United kingdom. kingdom. Divided kingdom. Judah, Judah alone. Yeah. Captivity. Return. Return from captivity. Years of silence, life of Christ, early church, letters to the Christians. I um, made a song for my kids years ago to teach them to memorize these. <clears throat> I haven't been doing it with them like I need to lately, but um, I might try to just record that for y'all and send it to everybody. It's just real, it's a tune you all know. Before the flood, the flood, the scattering of the people, the patriarchs. It just kind of goes through the whole song like that. You can just sing that and memorize it, make it fun. But y'all need to know that a little better. Um, sorry to, you know, I'm not trying to rebuke you or anything, but I'd really love it if y'all could just rattle that off without even thinking. So let's get a little bit better at that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to really think about doing that, and I might just email it to you or something like that. I'm not sure. Okay. Okay. Hey. You, you might have a point there. Okay. Moving on. Now, these are the three periods we'll be studying for the next two quarters. Captivity, return from captivity, and years of silence. All right? So we're going to be setting the stage for the next six months for the life of Christ. So that's where this is kind of all, everything has been heading that direction. Everything's been pointing to Jesus since, uh, since we started our study in Genesis. And so, <clears throat> so really these next six months are the, the, the last uh, portion of our study of the Bible that is going to be from the Old Testament. And then we're going to dive into the New Testament uh, after these two quarters. And that will be, uh, that'll be exciting. Okay. I'm going to, I just want you to 
you know, put your seatbelts on, buckle up, we're, we're gonna go fast, all right? Just through some history, you guys already know this stuff, just to kind of help to set up um, the book of Daniel for you. And then we're gonna, we're gonna delve into Daniel chapter one. I'm just gonna dive into that. So 640 BC, Josiah begins his reign. 626 BC, Jeremiah begins his prophetic career. In the 13th year of Josiah, um, Jeremiah is called to be a prophet. 625 BC, Babylon gains independence from, from Assyria. So the ball is now rolling on what will eventually become the you know, Babylonian world empire, Neo-Babylon. Then we have 621 BC, Josiah begins his, his reforms. All right? Now, it is about this time that Daniel is born. We don't know the exact year, but he has to be born around this time. So he grows up with Josiah as king. You think that might have had an influence on Daniel a little bit? Well, can you imagine? I mean, this is not political, but imagine instead of Trump, if we had Josiah, and he's the guy you heard about on the news every day, and the things that he would say were the things that were resonating in the hearts of America. I mean, can you imagine? So he grows up in the kingdom uh, of Judah at that time, and 612 B.C., Nineveh falls. Now, this would have been, Daniel would have probably been, you know, a boy, maybe let's say 9 or 10. We can't know exactly again, but imagine you're, you're that age, and all this is happening. So you've got, you've got Assyria falling to Babylon. And then in 609 B.C., so let's say Daniel is now maybe 12 or 13 or something around there, you, you have some things that, that are major that occur in Judah because Josiah dies. He's killed by Pharaoh Necho. He's replaced by one of his sons. Three months later, uh, Pharaoh takes that king into Egypt and replaces him with another son of Josiah who is Jehoiakim. That's the name he is given, and that's the name that we're aware of. We all, we all know who Jehoiakim is. We've been talking about Jehoiakim, right? So he was bad news. So, I mean, you're Daniel... You're 12 or 13 maybe, and the, the man who's been king your entire life is dead. Now there's a wicked man. His son is on the throne. Jehoiakim is bad, bad news. And it's ultimately really like Jehoiakim's fault uh, that the captivity really starts happening. Now in 609 B.C., Jehoiakim submits to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Fast forward, uh, 605 B.C., of course, you all recognize that the, the dates are getting, like, l less, right, from 609 to 605, because this is B.C., working our way up to Christ. So 605 B.C., that's the date to remember. Nebuchadnezzar takes control of Canaan, and the first group of captives is taken. All right? So that same year, Jeremiah prophesies the captivity is going to last 70 years. That same year, Daniel and his, his three friends are taken captive in that captivity, and uh, they begin their three-year training period to serve in the court of Nebuchadnezzar, all right? And in about the next year, that's when Jer uh, Jehoiakim burns the scroll of Jer uh, Jeremiah. So all that is happening in, in Judah while Daniel, as a very young man, is taken captive. Now, I want you to think about Daniel for a minute. He's probably, I would say, 16 to 18 at this time. We know that these were young people that were taken to this first phase. <clears throat> he has to be pretty young because his life spans the 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Now, you think about that. Think about by the time we have you know, Daniel in the lion's den, the 70 years are you know, just about up, right? So he would have been however old he is now plus 70 years by the time we get to that story. So if he's 18 at this time, then he was 88 at that time, right? So he's got to be pretty young here. Got to be pretty young. I don't know. I'm saying I'm guessing 16 to 18 is a wild guess. If he was much older than 18, then he was like maybe 90 or older when we get to that. Yeah, he could be. He could even be 13 or 14. Um, so we just, we, we just don't know. Yeah. All right. Book of Daniel, the, the message is uh, really simple, and that is Daniel in captivity. But I've got something a whole lot better for you, okay? Brian is the man. He came up with an awesome acronym, and I'm going to show it to y'all. All right, Dominion Above the Nations in an Evil Land. And this is, of course, God's dominion. 
he just came up with that and texted it to me today and I thought about it all day and I decided, yeah, I like that too. That's, that's really good. It's, uh, it's really kind of the message of Daniel in a nutshell. God's dominion above the nations. Over and over, that's the repeated theme. Uh, as particularly God's dominion over what nation? Babylon and the king of Babylon, right? But also God's dominion over the nations that are going to follow Babylon. And, in, you know, Daniel 2.44, the prophecy that God's kingdom will be established in the days of Rome and will crush and put an end to all these other kingdoms. And so God's dominion, I, that's the, the one word that comes to my mind when I think of the book of Daniel is dominion. So if you don't remember this whole thing, you know, God's dominion above the nations in an evil land. If you don't remember that whole thing, that's okay. Just try to remember D, Daniel, D, dominion. The dominion of God. I, I think that's the primary message. And um, so I think that's, that's really good. We're not going to be able to have this for, you know, many of our books. I don't know if we're going to be able to have that for any of the other books. But, uh, the, but that's really helpful, I think. That acronym. All right? Very broad outline of Daniel, just a two-part outline. The first six chapters are events in the life of Daniel and his three friends and <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar. So it's narrative, a lot of stories, first six chapters. Then the second half of Daniel, the last six chapters are like absolutely, completely different. What are they about? Prophecy, dreams and visions. So one through six, events, seven through 12, dreams and visions. So you just kind of remember that. That'll help. We're mainly going to be focusing on the narrative, but we will take a look at chapters 7 and, and 9 this quarter. But the rest, like 8, 10, 11, and 12, which are really hard, um, not that 7 and 9 are easy, we're going to be studying those chapters at the end of next quarter, the very end of next quarter. <coughs> so we will get to it. We're, since this study focuses on the chronology of like events as they're happening. That means we, we, get to we get to jump from Daniel to Ezekiel back to Daniel. And so it's going to be crazy, y'all. It's going to be fun. All right. And if you've never studied Ezekiel, that's going to be, that's going to be awesome. You guys are going to love that. <clears throat> so Daniel 1, a mind made up. Daniel chapter 1, a mind made up. Daniel made up his mind. <clears throat> that he would not defile himself. And so the lesson for you and I that I'm going to drive home for the rest of our class today is make up your mind not to be defiled by sin. <clears throat> make up your mind not to be defiled by sin. Such a powerful and practical lesson that we learned from, from Daniel. <clears throat> All right, verses 3 through 7 Daniel and his friends are taken captive. I guess that could start in verse 1. I'm not going to read that whole section. We've read a lot of that before. Uh, let me just kind of summarize most of that for you. So in, uh, the, near the, you know, in the early part uh, of Jehoiakim's reign, um, it's in, it says the third year. In the king's account, it says the fourth year. There's a way to work that out. Bob Walter talks about that in his book. But anyway, you, you have um, Nebuchadnezzar. Who's Nebuchadnezzar? King of he's the king of Babylon. He, he's bad news, right? Yes. Good. You read your lesson, Herb. Yes, you did. That's great. He comes and he besieges Jerusalem. This is year 605 B.C. Now, I'd like to encourage you all to remember that date. Please try to remember 605. That's the first phase of, of captives that are taken. All right, first group of captives that, that are taken. There's going to be three phases of the captivity. So this is the first one. And uh, so <clears throat> Nebuchadnezzar comes. <clears throat> he besieges the city. He um, basically subdues the king, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Jehoiakim. And he also takes from the temple of the Lord. What does he take from it? A lot of the treasures, right? And he puts them where? Yes, in, in his temple of his God and everything. And he orders the chief of the officials, and you kind of need to remember his name because he'll come back up later. Uh, his name is Ashphanaz. 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 Got it? Ashphanaz. Chief of the officials, Ashphanaz. Got it? Okay. 
So <clears throat> I read somewhere that you have to repeat something like eight times before most people get it. So I don't think I said it eight, but it got, I got close. All right, so he tells Ashpenaz, I want you to take from the land a certain group, a certain kind of people. And we mentioned a second ago, what kind of people were to be taken in this first group? The cream of the crop. The The young, smart, intelligent, talented. You know, the people that are just like all of us in here when we were 18, right? (laughs) We would have all been taken at that time. And so they they are taken. And then we, and what he also told him is that they were to be taken so that they could be trained in the language and in the culture of the Chaldeans. Chaldeans. Who are the Chaldeans? The Babylonians. Now, so, so Chaldea, Chaldean refers to the people, Babylon refers to the land, okay? And, but when you think of the Chaldeans, this goes way, way back. Like one, one of Noah's sons had a son named Nimrod, and he, he established all these different places uh, and, and, and all these different tribes, and one of them was uh, Chaldea. And you can go back to where was Abraham from? Ur of the Chaldees. The same thing. Or, you, you know, think about Genesis 11, and you have the Tower of what? Babel. Babel. That's just another word for Babylon. Right? It wasn't Babel because the people were babbling, right, when God confused their languages. Stone used to think that. That's a good way to remember that. But so we, we kind of have an intertwining here of, of Babel with Chaldea, and, and they are, they are uh, connected. They're connected. All right? Anyway, where was I going with that? So, so imagine you've been taken out of your land, and you've been you know, taught a totally different language and immersed in a totally different culture. And how long was this training to go, to go on before Daniel and his friends were able to actually serve the king in the king's court? Three years. Three years. And I want to read in Daniel 1, and look at verse 5. It says, The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank. Not the wine which the common people drank. The wine which he drank. And appointed that they should be educated three years, at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now this, <laughs> this would be a dream come true for a lot of people. We get to eat the king's choice food. This is like maybe like eating at a five-star restaurant, breakfast, lunch, and dinner 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. The king's choice food, the wine that he drank. So this would be enjoyable, right? It'd be like eating with the president. You're eating with basically in the, in the king's court kind of a thing every day. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So verses 6 and 7 mention Daniel and his three friends and their names. Oh, I meant to show this map of Babylonia and uh, you all all know where that, that was. This, this area right here between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers is known as Shinar. Shinar is kind of another term for, for Babylon. All right. Name of Daniel and his three friends. So we have Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those were the Jewish names, the names they were given. All right. What were the names that they were replaced with? What was Daniel given the name of? All right, Belteshazzar. Don't confuse that with Belshazzar from Daniel 5, who was the son of the Babylonian king that was acting as king. Uh, Similar, but not the same. So Daniel was Belteshazzar. What about Hananiah? All right, that's Shadrach. What about Mishael? Meshach. What about Azariah? Abednego. And it's kind of nice that these last two, you know, Mishael starts with an M, Meshach starts with an M, Azariah starts with an A, Abednego starts with an A because I'm going to encourage you to memorize these. If you don't know the Jewish names, you need to know the Jewish names. Now, we are mostly familiar with the Jewish name for Daniel, which is Daniel, but the Babylonian name for Shadrach, uh, uh, for Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, which is Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's good reason for that. It's because the book of Daniel, most of the time, refers to Daniel's three friends with their Babylonian names. 
And the book of Daniel most of the time mentions Daniel instead of Belteshazzar. A whole lot of times, Daniel, very few times Belteshazzar. Okay? So it's okay. It's okay. But I do want to encourage you to try to memorize you know, the, uh, the list on the right. Okay? Memorize the list on the, I mean, on the left and the right. Both lists. Just memorize both lists. How about that? Um, now, I, I did a little study. I did this right before I left to come here. Is I, I just looked, what are the names of the meaning of these names? Because the, um, the names that they were given were names after gods, Babylonian gods. All right, so Daniel's name, his Jewish name, means God my judge. Belteshazzar, the name he was given, means Bel's prince. Bel was like the primary god in Babylon. And in Daniel 4, in verse 8, Nebuchadnezzar mentions that, that Daniel was named Belteshazzar after his god, after Nebuchadnezzar's god. So this was kind of like an honor in their eyes. We are naming Daniel Bel's prince because he is awesome, right? Um, I'm sure they would have said it that exact same way, right? Hananiah means whom, god, whom Jehovah has favored. His name was changed to Shadrach, which means the command of Aku. Aku was like a moon god. Okay? Then you have Mishael, which means who is what God is. In other words, who is like God? Nobody's like God. Terry, you looked at me weird there. Who is like God is? We don't normally talk that way, but that's what Mishael means. Uh, Meshach means who is what Aku is. Aku is, again, the moon god. Right? So that's a little mockery to me. That's why... Mishael and Meshach sound so similar. They're basically kind of saying the same thing, just replace Jehovah with Aku. And then Azariah means whom Jehovah helps, and Abednego means servant of Nego or Nebo, which is another word for Mercury or Venus. They really worshipped, you know, the luminaries in Babylon. So that's the names they were given. So do you think we need to try to remember the Jewish names too? Right? I, th I think we should try to remember this. All right? Verses 8 through 21. Now, this is where we get practical. This is where I really get to the lesson that I want to drive home today, which is determine in your mind uh, not to be defiled. All right? And we get that from verse 8. This is our key verse. All right? Verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food, or with the wine which he drank. So, pardon me. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. He made up his mind. What's another version say? Some of y'all got something different? Resolved. Then resolved in his heart? Is that resolved that he would not defile himself. Resolved, just resolved. Okay. Anybody have anything else? Purposed in his heart. In his heart. All right. So you know what purposed in his heart means? It means he made up his mind, basically. Okay? So, so Daniel makes up his mind that he will not defile himself. Now, they, we, we're not exactly sure what it was about the food and the wine that Daniel regarded as defiling. Okay? Now, as it, as it pertains to the wine... Let me just back that up again. As it pertains to the wine... Were Jews prohibited from drinking anything that was a product of the grape? No. Nazarites were, right? If you had a Nazarite vow, you were. Uh, but Jews in general, they were allowed to drink the product of the grape. The product of the grape is, you know, in biblical language, it's called wine, whether it's intoxicating or not, right? So Jews could drink the product of a grape, okay? But um, something about this wine Daniel viewed as defiling. I don't know if it was because it was the wine the king drank, which wasn't like the watered-down, you know, wine that the common people drank, which would barely have been intoxicating. You would have had to really just drink a whole lot of it. If it was the king's wine, maybe perhaps it was more intoxicating. I'm, I'm just totally guessing. Something about it made Daniel say, I don't want to drink that wine. I don't want to be like what the rest of these guys are doing. They're defiling themselves drinking that wine. Maybe he saw that they were getting drunk at these feasts they were having, and things like that. So, again, I'm just speculating about that. Jason? Well, one of the things, too, I mean, is 
one, Bill Feist has been a great sermon on this because Daniel made up his mind well in advance of having to make a choice, what his choice was going to be. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll get there. The, the reason these people were brought over, the cream of the crop, was so that they could theoretically be indoctrinated, so that then they would keep the rest of the captives at bay and under control because now they're part of the system. And I think that may have been part of the uh, one, I, I understand not wanting to buy oneself on clean food, mm -hmm. but I think part of it may have been is I'm not part of no, 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 no crew. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, he is going to serve his God and him only, and so he's going to take whatever blessings God decides he's going to have yeah. and not that's, accept the blessings. That's, that's interesting. So whatever it was about the wine, I, I can't say exactly, but Daniel knew. And, and so it specifically mentions the wine and the, the king's choice food. Now, as far as the food is concerned, we do know that there were Jewish laws about what to eat, what not to eat. You know, passages like um, Leviticus chapter 11, which I studied today, and it's, uh, that's, that's great reading for if you just are ready to go to bed. And boy, but... Um, what kind of things were, what kind of things were they um, allowed to eat? Well, here we have it: chicken, turkey, beef, milk, butter, eggs, cheese, vegetables, so on and so forth. A lot of stuff they could eat. What kind of stuff could they not eat? Okay, pork. Uh, camel was one thing that was specifically mentioned. In, in, in Leviticus chapter 11, uh, birds of prey, um, web-footed birds, so on and so forth. So I, I think that it's very likely that in the king's choice food, there were probably some meats that would, would not be allowed for a Jew to eat. Right? I think that would be probably a safe assumption. Again, I don't know that. It, it could also be that some of the meat that was prepared might not have been bled properly. You know, Jews were not allowed to, to eat blood. Uh, and, and their food had to be bled properly. So whatever it was, Daniel knew what it was. Now, we're not under the old law, thankfully, and you know, we don't have to kind of worry about all that stuff. Uh, but the application for us doesn't have to do with food at all. It has to do with sin. Sin defiles us. I want you to tell me, what are some ways that sin defiles us? Yeah. It takes us away from God. Takes us away from God. Right? Yes, Phil? Sin, sin corrupts our thinking. How we Absolutely. see the process. Yes. We're, we're not clear. Yeah. We can't see it clearly. Sin blinds us from the truth. Yes. It fills our hearts with, with evil thoughts. Yes. Evil thoughts evil and th evil ideas. That's right. <clears throat> um, and that's one of the strongest arguments against you know drinking. And drunkenness is, look at what it does to your mind. Proverbs 23, look, look at what it does to your mind. It closes down the, the means of communication with God. Okay, closes down the means of communication with God. Absolutely. It also creates guilt. It can have all kinds of... It, it creates what? Guilt. Guilt. It affects in many ways. Yeah, yeah. Great answers. Terry? It usually builds upon itself. I have to do another thing. Oh, uh, yes, yeah. It, it takes you a lot further than you ever wanted to go. Keeps you a lot longer than you ever wanted to stay. Costs you a lot more than you ever wanted to pay. <laughs> it kind of, to Terry's point, it, it's, a, it's an exponentially growing thing, right? Yes. You do that one sin, you get away with it, nothing really happens. Well, that wasn't that bad. So right. you don't feel that as restricted from committing another small sin and yeah. another small sin. Yeah. And then all of a sudden... That's good. And so what, th what that does, that has to do with our conscience and what, what is happening to our conscience. So let me, tell, let me just kind of give you two divisions here, two, two categories to think about in terms of how sin defiles us. First of all, it defiles our mind and our conscience. All right? I know that because Paul wrote it in Titus 1, in verse 15. To the pure, all things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their mind and their conscience are defiled. Have you ever known somebody or been somebody who, it's like there's nothing regarded as reverent. There's nothing regarded as holy. Right? Nothing is holy. That's the, that's the person whose mind has become so corrupted by sin 
their conscience is gone, right? They, they cannot really determine the difference between good and evil because their senses have not been trained to do that. You know, Hebrews uh, 5 talks about that. Okay, so, uh, so that's one aspect. You know, and in, in fact, we, we even use words like... Um, Yes, but I'm thinking in terms, in terms of words that are related to defiling. Like when we talk about sin, what do we often call sin? Filth. filth. You know, if somebody's going to go watch some, some really ungodly entertainment, we'll call it filth. Or what else will we call it? Polluted. Yeah, polluted. Or we'll call it trash, right? And so we, we totally understand that. When, when we go and watch that kind of stuff and fill our mind with that kind of stuff, it pollutes our pollutes our minds, pollutes our hearts and our conscience. And, you know, there's verses like Proverbs 4 and verse 23 to guard your heart, right? Guard this, uh, this spring that is pure and clean from the defilements that can come in and pollute this spring, which will pollute then everything that flows from that spring, you know. I'm when you said the movie presentation when you were talking about the movie. Thing. You said somebody had recommended a movie to you. And they did. They said there wasn't wrong, anything wrong with it. And then you noticed there was foul language throughout the whole thing. Yeah. And that's a demonstration that the person who's watching that movie to you has become numb yeah. to that sort of filth. Yeah. Because they don't even recognize. They don't even recognize it. And 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 the second thing here, sin defiles us by by defiling our body and our spirit. Again, I know that because Paul wrote it in 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, our body is described in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's chapter 6, as a temple of what? Of the Holy Spirit. So, our body is a temple. And if we defile this temple by using our flesh to do wrong, then it's... It's defiling the temple itself, right? We're defiling this flesh, and the, the spirit within us is also, also defiled. So, kind of, kind of coming back to Daniel here, make up your mind not to be defiled by sin in the same way that Daniel made up his mind not to be defiled by the food and the wine uh, that the king was offering. And going to what Jason would say, make up your mind. I mean, there's a power in that. Now, I want you to think about Daniel here. He's, you know, he's in a land where he could kind of get away with doing all sorts of stuff, right? Just like Joseph when he was taken into Egypt. Daniel could have gotten away with stuff. Uh, and here they're giving him this food to eat. He could have just kind of thought to himself, well, I, I know that I'm not really supposed to do it, but that's all, I, all, all I've been given. And, you know, who's really going to care, you know? I mean, he did have his, his three friends and stuff like that. But... It reminds me of a, um, a man that, that I once knew. He has passed away. He was a lovely, lovely man. But he, he was a very elderly man, and he, he was telling me about when he was in the Army, when, when he was in the military, that he was a drunk. He was just a drunkard. And he said the reason was all they gave us to drink was beer. He said if we were going to survive, if we were going to drink anything, we had to drink beer. And the whole time he was telling me that, his lovely, sweet, godly, submissive wife was sitting there going, <laughs> she didn't say it out loud, but she was like, don't listen to that. Um, and I, I remember telling that story to Bob Waldron. And Bob said, well, th that man did have a choice. He could have drank nothing, even if it killed him. We always have a choice about sin uh, or about righteousness. So Daniel, he, he could have easily just, you know, rationalized, well, I've got to eat this. It's what they're giving me. And so we can rationalize that sometimes. Well, I don't have a choice. You know, that's the situation that I'm in and blah, blah, blah. But we can't do that, right? So make up your mind not to be defiled by sin, no matter what. No matter the, the situation around us, no matter the temptations around us, no matter how unpopular. And think about how unpopular Daniel's commitment here was. <laughs> Surrounded by all these other guys that are doing this other stuff. There's all kinds of peer pressure, you know, and, and uh, as, as the story goes on, there are other pressures that we'll kind of talk about too. So, so powerful. And, and there is a real practical value to making up your mind ahead of time. 
going back to what Jason was saying earlier. What is so practical about that? Making up your mind ahead of time not to be defiled by sin. Debbie? You don't have a decision to make in the moment of temptation. When we're in the moment of temptation, our rational brain stops working and our emotional side kicks in and we just want to, want to do you know, what we want to do instead of what we know we should do. And so, but if you've already made up your mind ahead of time, I'm not going to be defiled. Then when that moment comes, that moment of temptation comes. I've, I've already decided there is no decision to make in the moment of temptation. Think about that. There is literally no decision to make. Because you made your mind up ahead of time, what you're going to do in that. And in fact, we made our mind up when we got baptized, what we were going to do, what our commitment was. So that's, that's good. All right, how else is this practical? How else does this help us to make up our mind ahead of time? Jason. Because, one, it's going to require us to study and be familiar with God. Okay? Because if I'm going to make up my mind ahead of time about a circumstance I haven't experienced, right? I have to know what God thinks about Good. that circumstance and experience. Yep. Because, like, like you said, because then when I'm there, and, 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 and I stole this comment. Move it quick, sorry. <laughs> when, when you're there, like you said, there is no choice. Right. Because, and, and obviously, it's an easier choice because the more familiar you are with God's words, the closer you are to God. Right. So to make up our mind, we have to know what God's word wants us to do. Is that kind of what you're saying? Part of, part of what you're saying. Don't make a decision about that decision. Yeah, yeah, not making a decision is a decision, you know, just like putting off becoming a Christian. Well, I'm not ready to make that decision. Well, you're making a decision to not do it uh, until you make the decision to do it. Yeah, great. Okay, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself on the, on the slide there. Uh, as the story continues, so, you know, the commander of the officials, I assume this is still Ashpenaz, he's, uh, he's concerned. He likes Daniel and Daniel's friends, but he's concerned that if Daniel doesn't eat what he's given to eat, that he's going to end up, you know, looking kind of unhealthy. If he just eats vegetables and drinks water, he's not going to be as healthy as he does, these other guys. And he knows that if that happens, then he himself, Ashpenaz, is going to be held responsible for that. He's going to be in trouble for that. In fact, the way the New American Standard Version reads it, uh, it, it sounds like he's saying, I'm going to lose my head. It says, then you would make me forfeit my head to the king at the end of verse 10. So um, Daniel just says, relax. Give us 10 days. Let us just eat vegetables. And by the way, it wasn't just Daniel. It was his three friends had the same commitment. Let us, let us eat vegetables and drink water and then have a look at us and see how we look after 10 days. Okay. So 10 days go by, and how do they look? Fatter and more healthy than the other guys who are in the other stuff. So they keep eating, eating this. And by the way, look at the faith of Daniel there. He's just saying, relax. Let's just do this. Let's just try this. So at the end of three years, right, so at the end, end of three years, he's, he and his three friends are presented to Nebuchadnezzar, and Nebuchadnezzar is, in my language, he's basically blown away by Daniel and his three friends. He's so impressed by them. And uh, verse 19 says, The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. And that is because God was with these men. And ultimately the credit is going to go to God. We'll, we're going to really talk about that uh, in our next class, Brian will be talking about that, and I'll be preaching about that on Sunday. So, what a practical, you know, th there's also one more point I could throw in. You'll never regret the decision that you make to do, to do what's right. Um, you know, Paul says, all things work together for good to those who love God. And doesn't mean life's going to be peachy king all the time, but in the end, even, even if serving God gets you persecuted, you're going to be with God in the end. All things work together for good. Just have faith and keep serving God, no matter how difficult it is. That's the example we learned from Daniel. Make up your mind not to be defiled by sin. Hope that resonates with you and hope that sticks with you for the rest of this uh, week. Go ahead and ring that bell, Jason. All right, so please read through page 21A 
and uh, study Daniel 2. We're not going to have very much reading for each class. Most of the time is going to be just very little reading in the book. So that's going to require us and kind of free us a little bit to study more in depth each scripture portion that we're reading. So please study Daniel 2 in depth.